Okay. All right, very good. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. And, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, latest project that we have uh, been working on uh, for uh, our club. And that is a uh, whisper unit. A whisper stands for Weak Signal Propagation Reporter. Uh, it uh, is a uh, type of waveform that we're going to discuss this evening and see what it's good for, uh, how you generate the uh, waveform, uh, what kind of results you can get, to a, what type of uh, uh, performance you can get with a extremely low power uh, transmitter design. So Weak Signal Propagation Reporter was actually conceived um, by Joe Taylor, K1JT, and probably many of you know him, uh, whether directly or indirectly, through his uh, software program, WSJTX. And WSJTX was a program that Joe and a couple other hams put together to be able to work on various types of communications channels that had uh, either atmospherically ch or changing phenomena such as meteor scatter, uh, moon bounce, uh, very, very low uh, signal to noise ratios. So he was primarily interested in uh, moon bounce communications when he first put these together, but it's uh, sort of migrated to uh, what we now know as FT4, FT8, uh, started off with JT, which was uh, JT9 and JT65, uh, uh, which was after Joe Taylor, his initials. But uh, there are quite a number of different waveforms now that exist in that particular packet of, uh, of uh, software. Uh, Joe is a Nobel laureate in physics, so he's no slough. He's uh, a, a discovered a, a new type of pulsar. And uh, from that, he was able to derive uh, several important results in the gravitational theory uh, for which he obtained a, a Nobel Prize in physics. So uh, kind of uh, interesting character. You get a chance to go to Wikipedia, look up his uh, background. It's very fascinating. So as I mentioned, Joe was uh, interested in looking at propagation paths of RF signals, particularly for moon bounce communications at the time. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, he, it expanded to uh, meteor, sh meteor shower uh, communications, uh, tropospheric uh, propagation channels, and uh, in general, weak signal detection uh, pa uh, paths. Uh, so he was looking at a way of using encoded signals which uh, incorporated both forward error correction and burst error correction. And we'll talk a little bit about both of those in a few minutes. And uh, these are received and reported by a global network of receiving stations. And they include both amateur radio operators as well as shortwave listeners. And uh, we'll show a little bit of the results that you can get from this. The receiving stations report their data to a internet database, which is whispernet.org. So if you go there and log in, you will be able to uh, see where your specific uh, signal was received throughout the world. This is an example of a database uh, that uh, I, this is the first four entries of the database. You can see there are more than five, actually 5,000 plus spots here. And um, let's see if I can get a laser pointer somehow. Probably not. <laughs> I know there's a way of doing it, but I'm not going not to do it yet. So anyway, the um, the spot database is available to you at any given time. And you can look on that to look at certain parameters, such as the time of arrival of your signal. So here, this was uh, September 24th at 1450 uh, Zulu. Um, everything's in Greenwich Mean Time. You can see the call sign of the receive signal. These are spots that were, for example, the first one was by KB7YVW that picked me up from uh, 3,000 kilometers away on uh, 10 meters. And uh, the next parameter is the measured frequency to one hertz resolution, uh, the measured signal to noise ratio of my signal at their QTH, uh, the drift of my signal in terms of hertz per second, uh, whisper is a very, very narrow band signal, as we'll see uh, looking at the spectral density of it. And drift is extremely important. So drifts on the order of a few cycles per, per minute uh, are en enough sometimes to throw the receiver out of whack. So you have to be very, very stable. Also see the grid square of, of the transmitting station. That's me. Well, they didn't pick this out of the air. They They actually got this from my transmission. So my call sign 
my grid square and my power level, which is the next parameter, uh, are uh, are uh, and actually sent across the uh, air to to these receiving stations. They're, they're not derived from my signal. And finally, the reporting station, their uh, call sign, their grid square, the distance and azimuth to their location is also provided. So these are the types of reports that you get from the whisper transmissions. And uh, it gives you some feel for where your signal was uh, received, how much, uh, uh, how strong it was at that particular location, and uh, gives you a, a little better feel for what your antenna is doing, what propagation is doing. So let's talk a little bit about forward air correction. The way this works, and the, the only reason it works, is because it uses the uh, ability of uh, digital communication signals to embed additional information so as to allow error correction of the received waveform uh, on the other end. It's called forward error correction because we're only looking at a forward direction. In other words, I transmit from my location, it's received at another location. You might be familiar with ACNAC type communications where you transmit, the other person receives you. If he doesn't receive you, he sends you back a, a message, say, hey, try try transmitting again, you transmit again, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is only one directional uh, communication. So. Uh, if if it doesn't get decoded on the other end, it's lost and uh, not recoverable. Uh, forward correction, uh, error correction is a method of adding redundancy, as I mentioned, to digital messages so that a receiver can both detect and correct common errors in the presence of noise. Uh, a little block diagram that's common in, in communications uh, books. Uh, you have a set of, uh, let's see if I can get this. Uh... Yeah, there we go. So we, we have a set of K bits coming into uh, our, our transmitter input. Uh, it's our data stream. That's put through a forward error correction encoder, and it generates a code word which has N bits of data, and that N is greater than K. So in other words, I've stacked on a few extra bits. I've done it in such a way that I may have scrambled the bits a little bit on the data stream uh, to provide some redundancy. I've added some additional check bits, or uh, and we'll see later the convolutional code bits, which is what Whisper uses. But in, in any way, uh, the K bits are are merged into uh, N bits, and those N bits are then transmitted across the communications channel. Where they're received at the receiver, that code word is then put into a forward error correction decoder, and the data is extracted. Sounds very simple, but the complexity of it is coming up with the code word uh, in the first place. So here's an example of a, a, a typical code word. This is a what's called a block code. In other words, there are a couple data bits that come in, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And from those data bits, I generate a code word. So a 0, 0 is actually then transmitted as 0, 0, 0, 0. And uh, uh, the uh, same thing with the other uh, waveforms. They have five bits for every two. So this is called a rate two-fifths or rate 40 percent code and it's a block code in that there's a block of data that's sent into the uh, forward error correction and encoder and a block of data is transmitted outward this is not always the easiest way to do it uh, but it's uh, sort of the basic uh, principles that were used in early communication systems where i uh, break up the incoming stream into uh, collections of blocks of data and then transmit blocks of data out uh, that code word might be a binary FSK signal. It might be a frequency shift keying. For example, a zero might correspond to one frequency. A one might correspond to another frequency. So that's the other part of it. The data stream is then passed to a modulator, which then takes these code words and generates a, an actual RF waveform from them. The transmitter and receiver both know the code book. And also the transmitter, like I mentioned, takes blocks, maps them to code words, and then transmits the code word. The receiver takes those code words, maps them back to the data blocks. So one of the principal concepts of uh, coding is a distance measure. And uh, Hamming back in the 1950s came up with a, a distance metric, which is actually pretty straightforward when you, if you if you take a uh, think about it. But basically, what he looked at was a distance between two code words that was essentially 
the exclusive or of those two words. I, by exclusive or means it's just the number of bits in which the one code word and the other code word differ. So for example, if I have a code word which is 011011 and another code word which is 110001, the exclusive or of these two data streams is given by 101010. In other words, the, when, when the two positions agree, uh, I get zero. If they disagree, I get a one. So the Hamming distance in this case is the sum of all those uh, agreements and in, or, or disagreements, I should say. And that becomes, uh, in this case, one, 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 or a distance of three. The uh, minimum distance of a code book, in other words, a set of code words, is the minimum over all the Hamming distances between all the code words. And finally, the, when a particular code word is received, we decode it to a code word that minimizes that Hamming distance. Uh, some of you may have heard the term maximum likelihood. In other words, we try to maximize the likelihood that what we saw was actually correctly transmitted. In other words, we take in, into account what the probability distribution is of the of the noise that's uh, uh, basically added to the data stream that's transmitted to us. The thing that's important uh, for, for these kind of block codes is if I can develop a code that has a minimum distance, minimum Hamming distance of, uh, uh, of D min, then I, I can correct all code codes or correct all errors up to T where 2T plus one is less than or equal to D min. So if I have a D min of 10, then I can correct four errors in it. Um, it's because that gives me four times two plus one is nine, which is less than uh, than ten. Now, to actually go into coding theory and to look at how um, block codes work and how what we'll see in a few minutes uh, another type of coding strategy, which is called convolutional coding, works really is uh, two full semesters of, of, at a graduate level. It, it's going to take a, a, a lot of time. This is this is the five minute version. It's sort of like if you're familiar with Saturday Night Live, uh, uh, the uh, the actor that played, I forgot his name now, uh, played uh, Father Guido Sarducci. He had the uh, five-minute university, and he would teach you in five minutes everything that you would remember two years after you left college. So uh, this is going to be my five-minute uh, course on uh, error correction coding. The, the most important thing that happened with error correction coding and what Joe Taylor is taking advantage of in his WSJTX software is a fundamental result of Claude Shannon back in about 1948, 1949. What Claude Shannon did was he looked at what happens when I transmit a code word and I have noise that's surrounding it. So for example, when a code word is transmitted, there's some finite probability that the received message will be an error, right? From atmospheric noise, thermal noise, maybe some distortion, uh, incorrect timing on the decoder, uh, all kinds of parameters could come in there and, and cause an error. And if you think of a code word as a point in n-dimensional space, remember there are n bits in the code word that's transmitted. So that corresponds to an n-dimensional uh, set of parameters. Uh, X, Y, Z is a three-dimensional space. But if I look at those code words that I had before, which have six different uh, uh, ones and zeros in them, I can look at that as an n-dimensional space. And I consider all the neighboring code words that have some Hamming distance D or less from this code word. These form sort of a sphere, if you wish, in, in n-dimensional space. The, the concept that Shannon had was, uh, he said, look, if I have a, a transmitted data stream and I look at the sphere of code words around it that are some Hamming distance D or less from it. If As long as my errors are less than that D value, I should be able to decode what's going on. And, and what he did was he looked at all the code words that are neighboring to this code word and uh, like I said, generated a sphere around this. So everything that's inside this sphere has Hamming distance D or less. Now, here's an example, a specific example. This is uh, a eight-dimensional space, 101, is the code word. And these are the neighboring code words at a Hamming distance of one. So if, think of this uh, code word here as being this 101001 code word. And all these other dots are these additional points here, which are 
Hamming distance one or so away. Uh, there are a few more here, so this might be Hamming distance two or so away. So the, the concept that, that uh, Shannon had, and Shannon was a mathematician, uh, so he looked at this from a mathematical perspective. You want to pack as many of these spheres as you can into the n-dimensional space. So if you have a certain sphere of radius d, that means that you should be able to correct all the errors that are d or less from that particular code word. So think about packing all these d radius spheres into the n-dimensional space and see how many of those you can cram in there. Um, each a sphere corresponds to a unique data word. So here's an example of a two-dimensional space. Here are some euros here that that are just all packed together. And this is a two-dimensional uh, idea where the code word here is the center of one of these uh, coins and the space around it is the error that might exist from the location of that coin. Here's a three-dimensional space of a bunch of cannonballs. So each cannonball might represent a code word. So a code word in three-dimensional space might be a 101 that corresponds to this particular cannonball, uh, 001 corresponds to another one, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there, there are three dimensions that pack all these spheres together. So the, the if I can pack Q of these spheres into this n-dimensional space, then I have a code that has uh, Q data words, or in the number of bits, it's log base two of Q. So if I, for example, if I have eight code words that I can pack into my, my n-dimensional space, then I can transmit three bits of information. And the dimensionality of space is N. So the rate of this code is log Q over N. Now, so th that concept is if, if these spheres get too close together, then it's going to be impossible to determine what R is here. For example, if, if S1 is one code word and S2 is another code word, and they are not packed tightly but start overlapping, then there's a region here where I have no idea what actually got transmitted. But if, if I separate them by at least two epsilon, where epsilon is that error, then I should be able to totally tell what S1 is or S2 is from the received data stream as long as the number of errors is less than epsilon or the probability of error is less than epsilon. So what Shannon showed, which was uh, a, an unbelievable result for 1948, it, it was earth shattering and, and you'll see why in a second. He showed that if you can have a code that has a rate R, remember the rate is the, is the ratio of the number of bits that you are trying to transmit to the number of bits you are using to transmit them. So a rate one half code, for example, I transmit one bit, but I, I, I excuse me, I put one bit into my encoder, but I'm sending two bits out for every one bit. A rate one third code, I put one bit into my encoder, I send three bits out. So if I can come up with a code that has a rate less than some well-defined number C, which is called a channel capacity, then I can figure out a code that can make my probability of error as arbitrarily small as I want by choosing the right set of code words. That was an unbelievable result for that time. And the reason it was back in prior to 1948, everybody thought that if you wanted to make somebody hear you uh, and you're sending 101, then the only way to do that was to send 101, 101, 101, 101 until the guy finally gets it. So the, the concept was... There was no idea of channel capacity, no idea that you could be uh, have a, a minimum number of bits that you're going to transmit. Instead, you would just send the same thing over and over and over again until you got the transmission across. Well, obviously, that's extremely inefficient. So what Shannon showed was that doesn't have to happen, that there is a number called the channel capacity and the error can be made as small as you possibly could want. Here's an example of a, of, a, of a very simple communications channel. In this communications channel, I'm sending a, a logic one. I have a certain probability P that when it goes across the channel, it turns into a zero. So that's my error probability P. And with probability one minus P, then it, it, it ends up as a one. Same thing with a transmission of a zero. If I transmit a zero, I have a certain probability P, which would result in a one being received and a probability one minus P uh, being a zero. This is called a binary symmetric channel because there are two inputs and the channel is symmetric 
uh, between a zero and a one. The channel capacity of this is given by this kind of funky equation here relating to P, and it's actually one minus the entropy function. I think people may be familiar with entropy. The more entropy there is in a system, the more random the system becomes. So as P goes to zero or to one, the entropy goes way up. Um, and so that the, uh, the um, excuse me, the entropy goes way down. I've got it backwards. When entropy, when, when it, the probability goes to 0.5, that's when things are very random and the entropy is very high. So it becomes one and that, and the problem, and the channel capacity goes to zero. When the entropy gets very, very low, in other words, I have either a zero probability uh, of error, in which case a one is always seen as a one and a zero is always seen as a zero, or I have a probability of error being one. And it, that means a one is always seen as a zero and a zero is always seen as a one. Well, I know what to do there. I just swip, swatch, uh, swap the outputs. So in both cases, the channel capacity is one. I can send one bit to receive one bit. When the channel, the probability of error gets higher and higher up to 0.5, you can see the channel capacity gets lower and lower. But what it says is that as long as I have a rate which is less than the channel capacity, I can always make my error as arbitrarily small as I could possibly want. And this is what is taken into advantage uh, with WSJTX in order to do moon bounce, uh, meteor scatter, everything. We, we use coding systems that allow us to get very high uh, coding rates and yet have very low probability of errors. The problem, though, is how do you pick a good code? We know that codes exist from his sphere packing argument. We know that if we pack enough of these things into n-dimensional space, we can pick them in such a way that uh, we can uh, get a good code. But what is a good code? And that, that's the fundamental problem. Uh, you want the rate of the code to be as close to theoretical as possible, and you want it to be easy to do. So you want the rate, if it's uh, close to channel capacity, it becomes harder and harder to find a good code. So the study of this of these coding techniques and their performance is an unbelievably rich topic for research. Uh, there there must be tens of thousands of papers. Uh, I'm guessing several hundred books written on it over 75 years. So it's a it's a fairly complex uh, theory, but um, it uh, is probably the fundamental uh, event that occurred in uh, pr probably in our lifetimes in terms of communication systems. They compare Shannon with Einstein and. Uh, uh, a few other Nobel laureates uh, the, 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 in terms of what his result uh, ended up showing. So the, the question is, how does, how does all this relate to whisper? Well, we're trying to use some of these forward error correction concepts in order to make our probability of error as small as we possibly can when the uh, transmission power is very, very low. Think of if the transmission power is very, very low, we know that the error on the receive side is going to be fairly high. So we know our channel capacity is low uh, from that curve that I showed earlier. So we want to make as much use of that, uh, that channel capacity as we possibly can. So the, the way that the whisper works is, uh, let me go through the, uh, the process of uh, the actual transmission itself. Uh, in, initially, it starts off with um, taking your call sign, your grid square location, and your power level, and it compresses it initially into a 50-bit data word. So this is the, the, the data that we saw before. There's 50 bits, 28 bits for the call sign, 15 bits for the, uh, the grid square locator, and 7 bits for your power level. Uh, there's a, a very good uh, article if you want to go through all the uh, gory detail of how Whisper works uh, by G4JNT, which is on the bottom there. And, and uh, I'll also post these uh, view graphs up on the, the website, the Whisper website that we've been using. So these 50 data bits are then packed into a longer word, 81 bits long, by adding a, an additional 31 set of zeros. Well, why do we do that? We'll see in a second that the way this is encoded is uh, kind of a, a unique way. It's called a convolutional code. And those 31 bits are going to be used uh, in a specific fashion. We'll see in, a, in just a few seconds. The 81-bit word is sent to uh, a convolutional encoder. And let me show a picture of a convolutional encoder. Uh, first, I'll go back to the previous slide in a second. 
So here's an example of, of how a convolutional encoder works. We saw a block, a block code before where we take a set of bits and we map them into a larger set of bits, a set of ones and zeros, map them into a larger set of ones and zeros. That's called a block code. Every single block of data then gets transmitted as another block. Then we go to the next block. Well, that's fairly complex uh, computationally, uh, especially when the blocks are very, very long. So a simpler way of doing it is using what's called a convolutional encoder. And the way a convolutional encoder works is the data bits come in to the left side here. For example, let's say a one comes in and it goes through a set of, of, of uh, shift registers. So each shift register delays that data bit by one unit of time. So when a one comes in here, uh, the next time it moves to the output, then it moves to the output of the next one, to the next stage, the next stage, et cetera. So all the data bits that are coming into the left-hand side then go through the shift register. The outputs of the shift register then are sampled and they go into an ex exclusive OR gate. And those are sent out as uh, the code word so or a code symbol. So for example, if a, a one is present here and a one is present here, then the one plus one gives me a zero because it's, it's exclusive or. And on this side, I get a one with nothing else and I get a one here. So a zero and a one would be transmitted out. So for every bit that comes in, it gets shifted to the right and then two symbols are transmitted for every one. So this is a rate one half code. And uh, as the data goes through the shift register, uh, the code symbols C0 and C1 alternate back and forth and generate the uh, code sequence. So this is a very computationally simple way of doing it. The analysis of these shift registers are very, very complex. It has to do with polynomials and, and fields of polynomials and things of that nature. But the mathematics shows that you can essentially get the performance of block codes by not set, separating the data into blocks, individual blocks, but by passing them through a sequence of registers, which are much easier to implement uh, both mathematically and also physically. If I go back to the previous uh, slide, so in, in the convolutional encoder for Whisper, the length of that sequence was 31 bits long. So they have 31 bit shift registers in Whisper and uh, I, they are, they're a set of two of them. So each one sends a, a data bit out every time a bit gets shifted to the right. So this is also a rate one half code. The constraint length is equal to the number of shift registers plus one. So this is a call that convolutional encoder of constraint length 32 and rate one half. And the taps are chosen in such a way as to generate the code words which are far apart from each other. Remember when we talked about that sphere packing thing, you have all these spheres close together. If the sphere is bigger and bigger and bigger, depending on how much noise you get. So a, a large noise environment has these very large spheres and you can only pack so many of them in there. So that means your rate has to come down. So the, the concept is you wanna pick code words in such a way that they are as far apart from each other in n-dimensional space as you can get. So that if you do make some errors or several errors, in a row that they can be corrected. And that's the concept between, behind both the block codes and the convolutional uh, codes. So the whisper transmitter uses the convolutional approach since it's much easier computationally to do. So uh, again, the constraint length is equal to the number of shift registers plus one, and the rate of the code is just the number of incoming bits divided by the number of outgoing bits. So now we've got all these, and I should point out that, remember this is 30, it's not nine in this case, but it's 30, 31 or 32. So there are 31 shift registers in the, in the case of Whisper. So remember that number 31, where I had 31 zeros added to the uh, data stream? Those 31 zeros are used to basically flush out the shift register. So those, those 50 some bits that I had that encoded my call sign, my grid square, and my power level then are tacked on additional 32 bits that are 31 bits that shift through the registers and flush out the register. So the next time I transmit, it's all fresh and ready to go. The, uh, remember this is a rate 
two code. So there were 81 bits trans that were entered into the shift register. And there are two bits for every one bit that came in. So there are going to be 162 now that come out uh, of the encoder. Now, what Whisper also does is takes those 162 bits and doesn't just use them. It actually does a scrambling on them. Now, you say, well, why the heck would they do that? It's, it's complicated enough. Well, the reason for scrambling is... Uh, Joe Taylor was very concerned about burst noises that exist. Uh, in meteor scatter, that's a commonplace phenomena. Uh, and in any kind of low signal-to-noise ratio conditions, burst errors are uh, very, very problematic. So what he did was he developed this so that the 162 bits are scrambled so that they're spread out in time. So if I get a burst error at the beginning of my code word, then it's going to be able to be reconstructed by some data that's at the end of the code word because that has some information because of the scrambling of what took place earlier. So in other words, I use that scrambling mechanism to add some memory to the data stream so that if I do end up you know, bleeping out a few bits in a row, the other bits further down this down the pike can be used to reconstruct them. So that gives us an additional error correction capability that is well and above beyond the uh, the uh, convolutional coding as uh, that we had earlier. So finally, now we've got these 162 scrambled data bits, and what he does is in order, how do you synchronize to that? Well, you can't right because it's all random right now. Uh, we don't know what the data is going to come going to come in. For example, W2LNX has a different call sign than AK3Y. So the data bits that are going to be generated by his Whisper encoder are going to be totally different than mine. So there's nothing that you can get from that to synchronize to. So what he does is he takes a synchronization uh, data stream, 162 bits long, that has very, very strong correlation properties. In other words, uh, if I do a correlation on those bits, I get a very large peak, which will tell me where the data stream starts or finishes. Um, basically, they're using a pseudo-random code, if people may have heard that term before. So he takes the 162 data, the scrambled data bits, puts 162-bit uh, synchronization code on it, and then transmits it out. Well, how does he transmit the bits? Well, the way he does it is he constructs uh, a, another data stream. <laughs> this, this is not simple, as you can see. It's, uh, it's amazing that he came up with this. But he takes the, the synchronization scheme that, that, that we had, in other words, the sync uh, uh, pseudo-random code, and he takes two times the data stream. So he does, doesn't just add them together, but he takes two times that data. So he ends up with four possible output values, 0, 1, 2, or 3, depending upon what the data is and what the sync symbol was. So if sync was 0 and data was 1, I transmitted 2. If sync was uh, 1 and data was 0, I would transmit one plus two times zero, I transmit a one, et cetera, et cetera. There are four possible values for that. So now what do you do? Well, after all that manipulation, we've got our call sign, our grid square, our transmit power level all put into a 162-bit scrambled word. And each one of those symbols is equivalent to four possible values has very strong error correction capability, very strong burst noise correcting capability, and it has a very powerful 162-bit synchronization pattern. Now you can see, you're starting to see why these things can be received with very, very low signal-to-noise ratios. So to transmit this information, Whisper uses what's called 4 ARI frequency shift king. In other words, each one of those 162 symbols has one of four possible RF frequencies. He transmits this at a very low baud rate, one, one and a half basically baud, uh, one and a half bits per second. And the tone separation is also chosen to be very, very small, 1.5 hertz. So there are four, to four tones separated at about one and a half hertz apart. Very, very narrow band signal. 
This corresponds to about 110 seconds of transmission, almost two minutes, and the bandwidth is roughly 10 hertz. Doesn't, it doesn't quite multiply out if you take uh, the four frequencies and multiply by uh, actually four minus one times 1.465. You don't get 10, but the reason you get 10 hertz is because uh, when a symbol is transmitted, it actually generates sidebands. So those sidebands expand, and we'll see that in a second with the uh, spectral, spectral plot that I got. The thing that's probably most important uh, to remember is that with this high level of coding, the minimum usable signal to noise ratio for whisper is minus 27 dB. In other words, you can be 27 dB below the noise uh, and still recover the, the waveform. If you compare this with single sideband, for example, single sideband in a 2500 hertz bandwidth needs about four to six dB signal to noise ratio to even start being intelligible. So you're talking about 30 to 40 dB better uh, than a single sideband capable uh, capability for a whisper. To put it, put it in perspective, with no man-made noise, almost only thermal noise, this corresponds to a received level of one nanovolt uh, RMS. Pretty, pretty amazing. So let's look a little bit about the characteristics. This is what um, the spectral density of the whisper signal looks like. Uh, it's averaged over some time. But look at the the uh, points here. This is 100 hertz span across this entire uh, path. So each one of these is 10 cycles wide, each one of these vertical axes. So you can see that the waveform is roughly about 10 cycles wide centered at uh, some nominal ca uh, carrier frequency. If you look at a waterfall display of Whisper, it's hard to see here because I couldn't expand it too much further. This is using a Kiwi SDR as the receiver. But you can see the transitions occur, which are these sort of bright spots uh, where the waveform transitions from one frequency shift key tone to another frequency shift code. And this lasts approximately two minutes. And I think a lot of you have seen, if you listen to FSK, excuse me, uh, FT4, or FT8, or even Whisper on the shortwave bands, you'll see these uh, lines coming down your waterfall display. So let's look a little bit at how this works. So here's a, a, a spot database from a half a watt, a 10 meter whisper signal transmitted into an 80 meter half wave and fed antenna. And uh, give some idea of the types of signal to noise ratios we're looking at. Interestingly, here's one ND7M. I'm at plus eight d uh, dB signal to noise ratio, which is, and here's another plus 10 dB signal to noise ratio. So if somehow ND7M has either one heck of a good antenna, and everybody else is around minus 15, minus 20, or, or it just happens to be that the path uh, from my, uh, on 10 meters to from my QTH to ND7M is uh, favored at that particular point in time. Here's some more stuff that, uh, that comes out. This is from whispernet.org and uh, examples of uh, the uh, spots that I received off this whisper transmitter. The one on the left is a half a watt on 30 meters. Uh, got all the way up to the, almost to the North Pole and uh, all the way through uh, most of uh, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, it's kind of interesting to look at this. Uh, from this, you might deduce a little bit about your antenna pat pattern uh, in that you can see that my antenna pattern is certainly not favoring uh, Asia or South America. That possibly could be due to the propagation paths, but it also could be just because of the way the antenna is oriented. Here's uh, 10 milliwatts on 20 meters in this uh, lower right-hand uh, curve. Uh, again, uh, pretty spectacular what can be done with very low power levels. Um, as a propagation tool, Whisper is kind of uh, kind of interesting. Here's a, a single two-minute Whisper transmission. This is at half a watt on 28 megahertz. And within two minutes, I got 89 spots come back. And these are the ones that I saw. And I was, I was just flabbergasted. I, I actually just turned the rig on. I didn't think I was going to hear anything. I just suddenly saw these spots come back from a two-minute burst. And the next thing I did was I turned my, uh, uh, my, my 70, ICOM 7600 on. I burst out CW transmission at uh, about 55 watts on 10 meters, and I worked several Europeans. So it was, it was kind of neat to see Whisper predict that turning that rig on was worth its, worth, worth its while. <laughs> Interesting, though, comparison, if you look at the Whisper reports from whispernut.org, 
and you look at the same um, re reports from a 55 watt CW transmission uh, on a reverse beacon net, you can see it's pretty pretty thin. Um, so the the fact that that you can see so many additional uh, hits here in spots with whisper gives you some feel for how powerful the forward air correction code is versus even CW. Here's another interesting plot of what you could do with Whisper. This is again, 10 meters. And what I did was I just ran it for three days straight. And I looked at uh, the distances that were accumulated from the various spots that I got. And you can see the times when the band would open here from 1 to 9 p.m. on Monday, uh, suddenly we opened up into uh, Europe just briefly, uh, Canary Islands, so the western coast of Africa, and most of the, uh, the paths were to the western U.S. and a little bit to the southwest. And then it just went dead, deader, deader than a doornail from about 9 p.m. that day all the way through the next day until 8 a.m. So if you got up, uh, you know, around uh, uh, what puts your rig on around noon on the 17th of September, you'll say that 10 meters is definitely not worth getting on. <laughs> but it turns out at 8 o'clock the next morning, the band opens up into the Canary Islands, western U.S., et cetera, and then dies again at 8 p.m. It's very fascinating to look at these kind of uh, propagation uh, phenomena versus uh, time of Day. Here's another interesting one. This is a whisper transmitter uh, operating on the very low frequency band that we have, which is 475 kilohertz. And this is between me and uh, Mark and 4 dr um, You can see that I, I, here I plotted the signal to, signal to noise ratio that, that I received or he received of my signal as it was transmitted. And uh, you can see right about uh, an hour, an hour and a half to two hours before sunrise, the signal levels went up uh, close to 10 dB. And then the second the sun rose, the signals dropped about uh, 15 to 20 dB. That very fascinating propagation on those low frequency bands. So let's let's get a little bit into the meat of the whisper transmitter that we've got. This is what it what it looks like. A lot of you have already built it and are on the air with it. Some of you still have it, probably as kit form, and uh, still in the process of building it. But the uh, transmitter is on the left hand side, and this is just a uh, uh, a little RF amplifier used to boost the signal from the nominal 10 dBm output from the whisper box to uh, a little higher level. So the way the whisper transmitter works is that there is a ESP8266 microcontroller, a uh, little power conditioning coming off of a, a, a five volt regulator. Uh, the synthesizer chip is uh, run with an external temperature controlled crystal oscillator. What I found was that the onboard 25 megahertz crystal was not adequately stable enough to be able to uh, use the whisper rig above 20 meters. So what I did was I removed that crystal and uh, replaced it with a temperature compensated oscillator. That made all the difference in the world and now it's stable all the way up, probably in through the VHF range. The problem with the synthesizer is that it comes out as a square wave. So the next thing we have to do is we've got to get rid of the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, which is typical of square wave signals, and put it through a low-pass filter. That goes into the RF amplifier. You typically through an attenuator pad since the RF amplifier has lots and lots of gain. Um, it's talked about in the uh, manual, and that comes out to the uh, antenna. So let's look a little bit at the software. Uh, the, the the way this works is that the uh, microcontroller and the synthesizer modules are initially are initialized at the beginning. The uh, transmitter or the, the microcontroller uh, wakes up the uh, internet and sends a packet of data to a local time server. In this case, we're using the National Bureau of Standards or NIST uh, time time server. NIST, when it sees our packet of data hit it. It bakes, comes back and sends me a, uh, a stream of data, which uh, tells me exactly what time it is. And from that, I take that information and put my call sign grid and power level uh, into the uh, uh, format that's needed for the Whisper uh, uh, convolutional encoder. And that's all done in, in software as well. So if I connect to the Wi-Fi, I, I contact the time server, get the uh, universal time. If a valid reply is received, I wait for the next even time slot because whiskers whisper is sent every uh, even minute um, and uh, or every other minute, I should say. 
And at the start of the even time slot, the whisker whisper data, <laughs> whisker, I'll get it, whisper data data is uh, cycled through. And for each symbol, I determine which of the four tones to transmit, steer the uh, synthesizer, and then send that data out. And when all that's done, I go back and repeat the whole whole process again. The block diagram of uh, what we build our building is uh, here. Uh, I have a voltage uh, regulator chip, uh, 7805 regulator, which can take up to 35 volts in, uh, usually limit to 30 volts. Um, that uh, provides a very stable 5 volt signal to the uh, 5 volt of reference to the 25 megahertz temperature controlled oscillator. It also provides um, the power to the microcontroller and the SI5351 chip. Um, the synthesizer is controlled by taking the output from the temperature control oscillator and running into the synthesizer chip, which is uh, over here. And then that goes into a filter, which uh, is filtering the output of the synthesizer uh, to the uh, antenna. This is what the part kit looks like. Uh, the printed circuit boards uh, I had done at uh, JLC PCB out of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, they do just superb work. Uh, if you, it, it's uh, it's gotten to the point now where it's not even worth making your own printed circuit boards at home. Uh, it uh, they get to these back to you in about five to seven business days, uh, and uh, the quality is just excellent. This is an off-the-shelf uh, RF amplifier. Uh, the uh, microcontroller, the synthesizer that's been modified uh, to remove the clock, and there's a temperature control oscillator. Uh, these are the parts for building the individual filters. Um, I, I'm going to go real quickly through this just for those that have not built it yet. First step was we solder on all the headers. I made this as modular as possible. So really the job is just uh, soldering on a bunch of headers to the printed circuit boards. And those headers are provided in the bag that comes with the with the uh, uh, the uh, microcontroller itself. And then there's some additional headers that are provided in the kit. The other parts are installed. There's the regulator chip, uh, the uh, filtering for the regulator on these two capacitors here, um, the microcontroller with its Wi-Fi antenna, uh, the synthesizer chip, the temperature control oscillator, the filter modules pop in. Uh, these have the same format as the um, uh, the ones from uh, uh, Q, uh, I forgot the name of the company now, uh, there's a, a British British company that makes uh, similar types of uh, filters, a QRP something or other. Uh, and then there's a, a SMA connector for the output. Low pass filters, I won't get into, but there's a table of low pass filters. So th this particular uh, unit will go from 2200 meters up to 10 meters. Uh, it's going to require a little software change to go to six meters, uh, two meters, and 222. Notice it shows four. We don't have four meters here in the U.S., but uh, this was from a U.K. publication. So but we do have six, two, and 220. Um, it should be able to get this uh, rig up to two meters, and I hope to have a mod for it in the not-too-distant future to go from to add six meters and two meters as well. Um, programming the ESP, uh, the, the uh, real issue is downloading the Arduino integrated development environment, and that can be found at that location. Uh, you uh, open the transmitter code, um, and I'm not going to go through all these things. Basically, there are a couple steps that have to do with telling the Arduino IDE that, hey, I'm, I'm not using an Arduino, I'm using an ESP8266. The way that's done is and this is true for any kind of additional microcontrollers that you might want to add to your Arduino development environment. Uh, you add a what's called a JSON file. And that JSON file, which is an ASCII uh, file, uh, is added to the board manager uh, section of the preferences of the Arduino IDE. And that tells me, tells the IDE that, hey, I, I want to use all the very available 8266 chips that are out there. And then there are three libraries that are used in this particular development. One is JT Encode. And this is the guts of the whole Whisper algorithm. JT Encode takes the call sign your grid square and your power level and does all that magic 161 bits and adds the synchronization code and and what have you and it also generates the four area fsk waveforms so that 
JT Encode does the whole kit and caboodle for the Whisper. The Ether Kit SI5351 library is um, the library that controls the, the direction that the synthesizer is taking. In other words, what frequency it's going to be outputting on, what power level it comes out on, etc. And this double reset detector has to do with the ability of the uh, microcontroller to be put into what's called Wi-Fi on demand mode. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Let's see, uh, there's a couple other tools. And uh, once you've uploaded it, the, the one I want to just comment on the back, the bottom one here, when you finally uploaded all the, uh, the software to the microcontroller, you can attach now a serial monitor to the, um, the microcontroller and you can watch to see how the, uh, uh, the, the unit uh, functions, what it's doing at any given time. So the most recent software mod, I, I think you'll you'll like uh, what it what it does is as follows: once you got all the software loaded uh, into your Whisper transmitter, uh, it will come up and it will show up as a access point, and that means it looks like a Wi-Fi network. So what you do is you can do this on your cell phone, you can do this on your home computer. You log into that access point, just like you would any other Wi-Fi network. And as soon as you do, this dialog box will pop up. It will show you um, the um, available Wi-Fi networks that exist. And, uh, excuse me, I, I'm, I'm jumping one, one ahead. This is this is the what comes up um, on your cell phone, for example, uh, to log into that network. I'm sorry, I, I jumped one step ahead. This is what comes up once you've logged into that network. So when I log into the Whisper setup network, um, a Wi-Fi manager pops up. The Wi-Fi manager allows me to configure my Wi-Fi. And when I click on configure Wi-Fi, I end up with, an, excuse me, another dialog box. And, and this dialog box, shows me the existing set of Wi-Fi networks in my environment. From there, I can choose which one I'd like to operate on. So here's my Rabbiton VZ. <clears throat> then I'm, I send put the password in. I enter my call sign, my grid square, and my power in DBM. And I hit save. The second I hit save, I, uh, I end up with the Whisper unit starting to transmit. Um, the Whisper messages... There are two types of whisper messages. One is called whisper type one messages, and that is where the call sign is up to six characters, for example, AK3Y, or my wife's call sign, KA3FQD. The grid square is either four characters or six square, uh, six characters, FM19 or FM19JA for my QTH. And the power level goes from zero to 60 dBm. Doesn't, for some reason, the whisper protocol doesn't allow negative dBm. Type three messages, uh, are also extremely useful. In this case, instead of uh, putting in AK3Y in that dialog box, I'll put in bracket AK3Y, let's say slash four, close bracket. And what that allows me to do by putting the brackets in, it allows me to use these slash marks. So for example, if I want to operate as AK3Y in Virginia and I want to make sure everybody knows that I'm in Virginia, I might uh, want my call sign to appear on WhisperNet as AK3Y slash 4. I do that by, instead of typing AK3Y slash 4, I put bracket AK3Y slash 4, close bracket, and the algorithm knows to encode that properly. Same thing true if I'd want to operate from France, for example. I put F slash my call sign, put it all in brackets. I can use up to three prefix characters, one suffix character, has to be uh, 12 characters or less. Grid square, though, in, in type 3 messages must be six characters and the power level as before. So the, the Wi-Fi on demand part is that the Wi-Fi network and whisper parameters can be changed dynamically. So if you're traveling, if you uh, are overseas, you want to use this and you have reciprocal privileges in that country, uh, or if you decide that you want to change your Wi-Fi network, uh, you're at a hotel and uh, you know, you're at a different uh, grid square and you're at a different uh, Wi-Fi network, it's all can be done, <clears throat> all can be done by double clicking on the reset button on the uh, microcontroller and it'll bring up that uh, Wi-Fi on demand uh, dialog box. 
You just press back into that access mode by double clicking. Uh, it brings up those dialog boxes. You enter the new dialog box, uh, dialog information. All that information is stored in non-volatile flash. And the next time you turn the rig on, it goes right back to those parameters. Um, so here's a typical output. If you look at the output on a serial monitor, you can use um, something like uh, PuTTY or uh, uh, really even the uh, serial monitor that's built in the uh, in the Arduino IDE. But you'll see this uh, particular setup come out. Uh, the first thing it does is it says, hey, I found the uh, synthesizer chip and everything's working. I squared C found, that's the uh, uh, integrated in, uh, interconnect uh, communications protocol for microcontrollers. It says, hey, I, I got things working. I'm gonna start the configuration portal. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm gonna do, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is set myself up <clears throat> as an access point. And it sets it up as a uh, address 122.168.41. Um, the Wi-Fi manager starts, uh, it says, hey, I found five networks. Would you like to connect to one of them? I connected to the Rabbiton VZ one you saw before. The um, program gives me an IP address. Okay, I've assigned an IP address of 192.168.151. And it says, hey, you've already got me, uh, you've given me some new parameters. I'll, I'm going to save those. I, I must save those. I'll put them into the non-volatile uh, EEPROM. It turns out the 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 e, uh, the um, ESP eighty two sixty six does not really have EEPROM. It has a, um, a flash memory which can be used as EEPROM. So it's just a technicality, but uh, you'll see that uh, if you look up the ESP, you say, "Hey, it doesn't have EEPROM." Well, we use the flash memory to do the exact same thing. The next thing the Whisper unit does is sends an NTP packet. And what it does is it waits for the National Bureau of Standards to come back and say, hey, it's 4,632,862 seconds since January 1st, 1900. <laughs> Why it picks 1900, I have no idea. But from math, the software says, okay, I know when the next two minutes time slot occurs, I have to wait 52 seconds. I get data from the EEPROM, in this case, AK3Y, FM19JA, and 30 dBm. I start the transmission, 116 seconds later, I end the transmission, and I start the whole process over again. I get the NTP packet, send it to, to NIST, wait for NIST to tell me uh, what the time is, I then calculate when the next two-minute time slot is, and I just do this over and over and over again. So that's the that's the basis uh, behind this entire pro, pro, uh, project. With the use of sophisticated FEC and burst error correcting codes, radio transmissions can be decoded at distance of thousands, I mean, tens of thousands of miles using minuscule amounts of power. My best DX is Australia using 10 milliwatts, which I calculated as 850,000 miles per watt. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, it was developed specifically for amateur radio by Joe Taylor. And again, as I mentioned, it was primarily uh, interesting for him for meteor scatter and for uh, moon bounce. Uh, and it's still used today. WSJTX is used uh, for all those uh, various uh, types of waveforms. Our club project uses standard off-the-shelf modules and components. Uh, key design features were a Wi-Fi-based time-of-day acquisition for packet sync. Uh, Wi-Fi on demand allows you to enter at any given time a new Wi-Fi node, a call sign grid, and power level. We use a high temperature, high stability TCXO, and finally, uh, plug-in filters, um, uh, low-pass filters, a microcontroller, and synthesizer boards. Um, the uh, the way to change the bands on the Whisper unit, uh, you change the filter, the low-pass filter, and there's a jumper. Uh, switch on the module itself that allows you to pick one of eight different bands and in the code you can sh you can choose which one of those eight bands or which eight bands you'd like to use and that's it so thank you very much I, I, I realized I should have had a glass of water next to me I apologize for his scratchy voice there um, but uh, uh, I open it up to questions and uh, be happy to take them yeah I have a question yeah have you considered submitting this to QEX? I have submitted it to to them uh, just the other day, um, and uh, they got they they're in the works. They're they're a little on the slow side, but I hope to get it published. Um, the um, 
the dummy load watt meter, by the way, project that we had is coming out in uh, in in uh, QST in February. So uh, that was that was nice. And uh, so all, all of you guys that were involved in the dummy load project, you might see uh, see that come out. Um, but yes, I, I did submit it to uh, to uh, QST. They they automatically submit it to a QST and QEX. So you don't you no longer submit them anymore to individual mags. And let's see, how do I get back to my main screen? <laughs> I can sort of see people, but I'm seeing myself here. Uh, oh, here we go. There we go. I have a question. Yes. So um, would there be any advantage of replacing the temperature controlled oscillator with a, uh, a GPS module for your timing? Yeah, uh yeah, and that, that's been asked a, a couple times. Um, the the answer is yes and no. Um, the one one of the one of the issues with uh, GPS is obviously you need another antenna, uh, whereas the, um, the the ESP has that built in, so that you need an external antenna to be able to actually get ex, uh, to acquire at least three satellites. So that requires an extra line going out and what have you. Uh, it. I thought about that. It just adds more expense to the to the uh, to the uh, the device. Um, I think what I'd like to do in the in the future is have that as an option. So what it, my thought was, um, the next version of this would be to uh, uh, put a switch on there that allows you to uh, instead of using a TCXO, uh, run it off the 10 megahertz. The, the problem with doing that um, is the is is the following that the SI fifty three fifty one synthesizer chip comes in three different flavors. There's an SI fifty three fifty one A, B, and C. The A uh, can only run on a twenty five megahertz or twenty seven. I think it's twenty seven megahertz clock, and uh, you can run a TCXO into it by by essentially uh, ripping off the twenty five megahertz clock. The SI5351C will allow an external port entry for like a 10 megahertz reference. So you could reference um, that with uh, a GPS oscillator, you know, uh, uh, GPS derived oscillator. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that would basically solve part of the problem. You still need to extract the, the GPS, <coughs> excuse me. The GPS timing information as well as the 10 megahertz clock, but in order to do that, I, I would have to essentially build a, a SMD, a new SMD board, which mm -hmm. has the SI 5351C in 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 lieu of the the 50 the 5351A chip. I thought it, it, the the SI 5351A chip was like a dollar thirty. <laughs> and so, so stripping off the uh, the the five cent 25 megahertz crystal. And replacing that with roughly about an eight or nine dollar TCXO was still a lot less expensive. Total about ten bucks versus for those two parts versus uh, running a, a separate GPS, and, you know, receiver and antenna. Okay, thanks. Long-winded answer, but the, the you know there the ones that that do use uh, GPS, um, they're significantly more expensive. Uh, I've seen several offered for sale. Um, they, they, they were, uh, uh, in the 75 to hundred dollar range. Wow. Okay. I've, I've, I've seen them. I don't know how good they are, but they're like $20 or something like that, but I don't know if they're, if they're worth that much. Yeah. Some of them, some of them are pretty much garbage, unfortunately. Uh, the ones yeah. that I've seen that are good are, are, you know, you, you get what you pay for, you know, is the sort sure. of moral of the story. But um, yeah, I've I've heard some some complaints about some of the cheap GPS units. They don't work at some of the higher frequencies. Say, the same problem that I had with the uh, with the SI fifty three fifty one using the internal oscillator. Um, it, it does it for some reason the stability wasn't there, and I'm not sure why that's the case. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love to see if what, whichever one you had. It'd be interesting to test it out and see how it how it does. But yeah, it it, it was off of Amazon, and I I just I. Hadn't really researched it. I wanted to get a reference clock for my frequency counter. Yep. And uh, and uh, I um, I still haven't purchased any uh, any GPS reference, but I understand they're very stable when you get a good one. Oh yeah, yeah, they're extremely extremely good. Um, I use a GPS uh, derived 
uh, clocks for all my test equipment. And uh, I get basically accuracies down to a thousandth of a hertz. Yeah. So, yeah. And the time measurements are down into the tens of picoseconds. Yeah. One, one other quick question. Um, does Whisper have to work as a dedicated radio or transceiver where it's controlled by the program where it will be a receiver for a while and then it'd be a transmitter for a while? No, this one is a pure transmitter. Uh, th there's no receiver involved in this. Uh, I, I, I may have misunderstood your question that there, there is uh, certainly a receiver uh, in, in terms of a distributed network of receivers that are used to uh, detect and decode your transmission and then uploading that via the internet to whispernet.org. But in terms of, you know, if you wanted to just use this and see what the propagation paths are, it's all one, one direction. You know, you could just have a single transmitter. Okay, I I I I misunderstood that. Yeah, yeah, that's that makes more sense because I understand. My thought was is that you basically had a dedicated transceiver for Whisper, but that's only to be part of the network. Yeah. For, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so for example, uh, I have an ICOM seventy six hundred HF rig, and uh, if I uh, use WSJTX to uh, talk to it, um, I basically can transmit a whisper transmission from my icom and i can also receive it and upload to the whispernet.org through the wsjtx interface so WS, wsjtx is bi-directional you know you, you can mm -hmm. both transmit and receive whereas the whisper unit that we're building uh for the club is sort of a one hand clapping thing you know it's it, it's only one way it's it's a transmit only device and your mm -hmm. receiver is everybody else in the world you can uh, okay. you know you you can uh, what i've also done is i've hooked up into the kiwi sdr network i don't know if you're familiar with that um if you do a search on kiwi sdr receivers you'll find a network of about 8 or 900 uh, receivers all throughout the world that you can uh, log into and control just as if it was sitting on your desk as a re as a receiver. And uh, it, it's a really nice way, well, a couple of nice things about it. So let's say you want to practice your uh, your German. You can log into a German uh, you know, station uh, on, on the broadcast band and listen, listen to it right from Germany. If you want to see whether your QRP rig is making it to Ohio, you can find the Kiwi SDR in the Ohio area look for your transmission at that frequency and and see how well you're doing. And in fact, when I built um, uh, this little tuna tin S unit that I that I did in a few years back, my very first uh, uh, transmission was being received on a Kiwi SDR. And I was uh, shocked that I, I got a guy in the uh, Caribbean that was hearing me and I was hearing him on a Kiwi SDR that was in Ohio. So... Mm -hmm. But that's a, that's another nice way of checking to see what propagation is and how well your system is working. But the uh, the whispernet.org uh, network will give you a very detailed analysis of what your signal strengths are uh, versus time versus band, and and uh, mm -hmm. it's it's great for assessing the performance of a particular HF link. Yeah, yeah, no, I I um when I when I built my uh, uh, 40 meter half wave NFED antenna. I use FT8 to, to see how well I was getting out. Sure, sure. Yeah, PSK yeah. Reporter is another one, um, th th which is good for FT8. Um, yeah, and, and when you, you you change the position, you can see because I noticed you had that graph where you were where you had a, a certain coverage, but you weren't going down to South America and you weren't going right, on the, right, but. But is that some somewhat of the orientation of the antenna? Or yes, can that be I think it's probably mainly the orientation of my antenna in 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 that case. Um, but you know, it, ten meters is a funky band, as 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 many of us know. You you can get on ten meters, and I remember operating a club station from Chicago a number of years ago as a as an undergrad, and uh, uh, I got on in the morning, and and I uh, before school started. And there was, um, I turned on the 10 meter band and there were two conversations going, two separate uh, places, both of which were Zambia. 
there were two two stations from Zambia on one frequency, two stations from Zambia on the other frequency. That was all I heard, <laughs> and it's like that was unbelievable. You know, it's just really weird that that particular propagation path made it to that part of the of the world, and then a few minutes later, it was all gone. It was someplace else. So ten meters is kind of an interesting one where you see the propagation shift versus time. You'll see Northern Europe come in, then you'll see Western Europe come in, then you'll see North Africa come in. You'll flip around to South America, flip around to Australia, and then it's dead in a doornail for the next day and a half. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but so whisper is a nice way of, of determining what that uh, that phenomena looks like over time. It's also, like you said, it's a nice way of seeing what your antenna pattern is on on bands in which the conditions are sort of uniform. You know, uh, forty meters mm -hmm. would be a good one. Uh, Twenty meters probably even even there. But once you start getting into uh, fifteen and ten, I think you're dealing a lot with uh, with F layer, E layer. Uh, situations that uh, you have yeah, no control over. Yeah, especially six meters. And six meters particularly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the... Sure, sure. Yeah, but quick quick question, uh, Bob. Yeah. Um, uh, let's say you look at the, uh, your map, your uh, whisper map, and it looks like there's nobody uh, in Africa, say, picking you up. Could it just be that there's there aren't any... Whisper receiving stations throughout yeah. most of Africa. A abs absolutely, absolutely, and, and in fact, Africa is probably the outlier on all this stuff, right? Because uh, uh, unfortunately, there are not a lot of uh, people that can afford amateur radio equipment, nor are there many countries where you could actually operate amateur radio equipment, given wars, war situations in in certain parts of Africa. So you're absolutely right. What you'll find um, in general, and a lot of us have found uh, on our first few whisper transmissions is you'll see a, an ea8 come in a lot there are several ea8 canary island stations that uh, are always always there so if you make it into the canary islands the probability is very high that you're probably making it into the rest of africa or certainly into africa uh on that specific band um but yeah you're right the, the, that's a that's a problem uh but like for example south america uh, there are a lot of stations in South America, and I, I typically have a very big, uh, a very hard time getting into South America with the way my antenna is configured. I'm sort of facing, um, I have an NFET 80 meter, and it's sort of going north, north, uh, east, uh, south, southwest. So <clears throat> the lobe is uh, not favoring it. <clears throat> Thank you. Question, Bob, about um, the websites you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Yeah, right. right. Since I'm a late comer uh can you give me some more information or the site name sure sure what what i did was i i have everything uploaded um all the manuals uh all the uh, uh the design uh, files and everything's uploaded to uh, uh my name was just robertfontana.com uh, I, I was trying to get AK3. I have AK3Y.com, but for some reason I can't directly get that. So it's robertfontana.com slash AK3Y in caps slash whisper. It's uh, all caps, W-S-P-R slash whisper, all caps, dot HTML. So it's robertfontana.com slash AK3Y, all caps, slash whisper, all caps, slash whisper, dot html where whispers all caps and dot html is lowercase and if you go there you'll you'll see absolutely everything okay thanks for that and when you say whisper you want the abbreviation wspr yes. okay yes wspr that's correct hank hey bob i have a quick question for you sure first and foremost thanks through john for inviting uh those of us from carroll county on the call. Uh, this was great. And I'm sorry if you shared this with your club already, but out of curiosity, I'm assuming it's the Wi-Fi capability, but was there a reason that you chose the ESP platform over any other microcontroller? Um, yeah, a couple a couple reasons. One was cost. It, it, it was uh, extremely low cost. Um, the other one was that it had all the capabilities that, um, that I needed. And it also had the um, uh, enough RAM of non-volatile RAM to uh, uh, to not worry about uh, putting the code, embed, embedding the code, and uh, also uh, uh, embedding the uh, 
a whisper parameters. Uh, so it had a lot of space available. It's 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 very extensible from where it is too. So I, I think I can uh, add some additional functionality to it. Uh, it's an amazingly powerful micro uh, given its cost. I think the cost of the, if I remember correctly, the cost of the the ESP eighty two was I think like a, a buck sixty or something like that. It's it's hard to get micro you know microcontrollers in that in that range. You know. <laughs> Especially with Wi-Fi capability, um, it uh, there there are other micros out there. Uh, you could you could do this whole thing on a Raspberry a Raspberry uh, micro as well. The new the new ones, uh, but uh, I, I like the uh, the ESP platform. Yeah, that's why I asked. I saw someone was doing a project with the Pi Pico, and I yeah. haven't really dug into his code yet, or or even the wiki on the project. I it was just. More curiosity why you made the choice, but I think yeah, it was it really there. Yeah, it, you're right, Don. I mean, there's there's several there's several micros that would have worked just as well, but um, I, I particularly like the ESP. And the other reason, by the way, I use the ESP is that one of the guys that first developed um, the uh, this this algorithm for uh, was uh, an Australian guy, and he chose that as a microcontroller. So um, I kind of followed in his in his footsteps as well. The very first Whisper unit. I built was the one that uh, Mark and I, uh, N4DR and I played with, and that was a 630 meter uh, whisper unit. And uh, that's where I first started playing with the ESP8266 micro. Gotcha. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you so sure. much. Thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I think the next step on, on this is uh, uh, the couple things I have in mind of doing is one is I'd really like to be able to extend the frequency range to six meters and two meters on, on the uh, unit. Um, for some, I think right now, for some reason, there's something limiting, and I think it has to do with the code that, that uh, was, is controlling the SI5351 chip. The 5351 will go up to uh, about 160 to 200 megahertz, so it should handle six meters with no problem. But for some reason, it's just not able to do it. I think I'll look in the code and exactly what the guy's doing on that. Um, it, it's possible to just hardwire code for six meters, which I've done before. So maybe that's the way to solve that. Um, the other thing was was mentioned earlier was to add a GPS capability to it, uh, if that's another option. There are times when you're completely off the grid. Uh, you have no Wi-Fi capability. Um, be nice to be able to just plug in a, a GPS unit and uh, be be done with it. Um, I found that the, the Wi-Fi seems to be, uh, you know, works very, very reliably. Uh, I can run this in my backyard off my cell phone. Uh, it will synchronize perfectly fine. And uh, so there, but if I don't have cell phone coverage, you know, I'm SOL. So, you know, G GPS is nice. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I have a comment. Yeah, Dave. I've been playing with the uh, PSWS, which is the personal space weather station, you know, from the Hamside folks. And uh, so the GPS uh, steered oscillator is from Leo Bodnar, B O D. Yeah, Bodnar's right. <clears throat> Good stuff, inexpensive. It's just, it's just amazing, mind boggling, in fact. So, and it comes with an antenna. It's, it, and I power everything. You know, I use the USB ports of the uh, uh, of the Raspberry Pi four as power ports for the <laughs> yeah right right yeah uh, so that works and for an antenna I'm using an indoor uh, Alex loop with a with an RF preamplifier and it works great and it's it's been running since before the Eclipse. And yeah. the um, uh, the principal scientist, the, P the PI, the principal investigator, was actually here in my house, Christina Collins, and she begged me, leave it running. <laughs> yeah, right. So he's, you know, it's every night, it's uploading data at midnight, and it's amazing. And so it collects every second, uh, the, yep. the Doppler shift <clears throat> of the ionosphere going up and down, and uh, it also makes pretty pictures. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, Leo Bod Leo Bodnar has uh, the mod the module for the uh, ICOM ninety seven hundred that um, people are using on twelve ninety six, 
one of the problems with the ICOM 9700, I don't know if, if, if people, uh, some some of you may have that rig, uh, which is a, um, a two meter 432 and 1296 uh, transceiver. Um, on two meters and, and 432, it's pretty stable for FT8 and things like that. On 1296, when you start doing moon bounce or um, very sophisticated uh, digital communications, um, the stability is not as accurate as you would like. And the reason for it is that even though it'll accept a GPS input in the back, it only updates it every uh, so often. You know, it does, it, it's not doing a, a synchronous, uh, you know, um, a communications with the uh, with the 10 megahertz clock. So um, the uh, Leo Bodnar's, what, what that does is, is it bypasses the internal mechanism on the 90, 9700 and takes and uh, uses a local oscillator generated by the uh, the GPS 10 megahertz. I think it generates like uh, 41 megahertz or something. I forgot what the number is. And then controls the uh, rest of the ICOM from that. So it's uh, all phase synchronous. But uh, I, I hate to dig into a piece of equipment like, <laughs> and do and do SMD SMD surgery on on it. So I, I haven't gone that route. I actually, I bought the parts. It's actually um, um, capacitively or inductively coupled. You just lay a board next to it, and it just just locks on. There's oh, that's no... good. That's good. Yeah, so it's worth going there. I have the kit. It's one of my to dos for the night. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, nine seven hundred. I was recommended if you're going to do whisper, long distance, get that out. You know, fix f fix that. Yeah, well, there are very. I'll tell you, whisper on two meters, four thirty two, or, or or basically those two bands. The only people that I've seen on whisper net that are using those frequencies are Australians. Oh. <laughs> so. The chances of you making it into Australia on two meters on Whisper, I, I'd say like 10 to the minus 35, something like that. <laughs> I'll be happy with my friend up in um, Frostburg, 100 miles, 101 there you go. miles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Whisper, Whisper Net, uh, there's there's very, very little activity uh, on two meters and uh, 432. There's, there's a lot of activity on six, though. That's why I'd like to be able to get the thing to go on six. Anybody else? Said any comments or questions or? I hope it's been fun for for some of you to build this thing. I, it's uh, it's certainly uh, been a lot of fun for me to uh, to uh, be able to put this together. So I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to to do this. It, like I said, it was very surprising. I I expected maybe eight people uh, that would be interested in it, and like I said we've got 25 total that are building. So uh, that's uh, that's great, uh, and uh, it's uh, I think uh, something I'd like to do more of. Um, if you have some comments or questions or uh, ideas for another project, uh, let me know. I I'd love to get involved in that. We've had, uh, this is the third one that I've been involved with. We did the uh, dual band J-pole antenna um, design uh, a while back. And then we did the uh, dummy load watt meter design. And uh, now this one. So those have been kind of fun projects. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Um, and I guess we have this recorded somewhere. And uh, I, what I'll do is I'll put uh, all the view graphs up on uh, that site that I mentioned to Hank. And um, and if I, uh, it might be a way of getting uh, who the attendees were, so I could send the message out. But if not, I'll just put it on the reflector and uh, and be done with it there. I think that's probably just as well. So, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Great, there, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, really thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. See you soon.